Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Nutrient Management in the Age of Digital Agriculture. My name is Julia Freuk. I am the project coordinator here at the Partnership for Ag Resource Management and will be hosting the webinar this morning. We are joined today by my colleague, Mark Adelsberger, Resource Management Specialist for the Partnership for Ag Resource Management, who will provide a brief introduction. I'm also pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Scott Shearer, Professor and Chair of the Food, Agricultural, and Biological Engineering Department at The Ohio State University. Before we begin, I will go over some brief logistics. Please make use of the question box on your screen to type questions for Dr. Shearer during his presentation. I will moderate the questions during the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar after the presentation. We suggest viewing the webinar while connected via Ethernet for best audio quality performance. You will receive an email in the next few days with the webinar recording and a webinar evaluation. The recording will also be available on partnershipfarm.org. By attending today's webinar, you are eligible for 1.5 CCA continuing education units, one for nutrient management and 0.5 for soil and water management. You must be present for the entire webinar to receive those points. If you submitted your CCA number at registration and are watching the webinar live, no further action is required to submit your CEUs. If you are watching this on demand at a later date, please be sure to watch the entire presentation through the GoToWebinar platform and not YouTube to receive credit. You must submit your CCA number at registration to receive CEUs. If you are watching the webinar recording more than two weeks after the original broadcast, please email julia at partnershipfarm.org your CCA number to ensure your credits are submitted. Please make a big note that credits often take a few weeks to appear in your account. If it has been more than three weeks, please contact my email. And now, with the logistics taken care of, I will turn it over to Mark, Resource Management Specialist for the Partnership for Egg Resource Management. Thanks, Julia, and thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, the Partnership for Egg Resource Management is an effort of our nonprofit IPM Institute, along with many other projects in agriculture and communities, each focused on using the power of the marketplace to improve sustainability. Our team of 23 is currently working to increase adoption of best management practices and improve outcomes in health, environment, and economics, all key elements of sustainability. IPM works with pest control companies, hospitals, schools, and other facilities in communities. We also work with food companies and farmers around the world to improve practices and performance and to communicate those benefits to buyers and the public. Our goal with the Partnership for Ag Resource Management is to collaborate with ag retailers to identify and promote revenue generating products and services that keep inputs on cropland. We track sales of these beneficial products and services through annual surveys and estimate reductions in nutrient losses that result from these sales. We then provide an individual nutrient stewardship report to participating ag retailers that compares location info with aggregate state and basin wide data. An overall survey report is also provided. We work with ag retailers and industry associations to publicize positive survey results through press releases and articles. It's very important to get this positive news out to address misperceptions to the public about agriculture. We're all aware of the water quality challenges we face from the record-breaking algal blooms in Western Lake Erie Basin to the larger than ever hypoxic zones in the Gulf of Mexico. The two photos on the right shows what happens when too much phosphorus gets in the water. The result is produced algal blooms, which close beaches to swimming, make fishing a challenge, and have also shut down public water supplies. 
We know the phosphorus is coming primarily from cropland because of the timing of the loads. They spike during snow melt and rain events in winter and early spring following fall applications. The graph on the left shows NOAA's annual data on algal bloom severity since 2002. We can see that algal blooms are becoming more frequent and severe, making it increasingly important to convey the economic environmental benefits of products and services like cover crops, variable rate application that help retain nutrients on fields. Ag retailers have valuable products and services already in their inventory that help improve water quality. This chart identifies several of them and their potential nutrient loss reductions based on published studies. There's a lot of variability in the published numbers based on soil type, slope, proximity to surface water, and other factors, but these rough averages give us a sense of where we can likely make a difference. Ag retailers are making a difference. Our annual surveys show large increases in several products and services, including variable rate phosphorus application in the Sandusky River watershed, increasing from 17% of acres serviced in 2011 to 66%. In 2015, we secured funding for ag retailers to offer a discount on variable rate technology to farmers in the Sandusky River watershed who had not used it before. We expanded to three additional watersheds in Northwest Ohio last year. We've had more than 30 ag retailers and 250 growers representing more than 20,000 acres participate. Using published estimates, Serviced acres utilizing VRT in this graph kept more than 525,000 pounds of phosphorus and over 1 million pounds of nitrogen from leaving cropland in the watershed. It is vital that we track and report the improvements retailers are making so that regulators and the public are aware of these voluntary efforts. With that, I'd like to turn the mic back to you, Julia. Thank you, Mark. Our team also provides free resources for egg retailer employees, grower clients, and consultants, available on our website, partnershipfarm.org. On the left is our continually updated and 4R approved agronomist handbook, available free for download. The handbook includes algal bloom updates, trends in customer product and service adoption, and fact sheets that you can provide to grower customers to increase awareness of products and services that reduce nutrient runoff. Our phosphorus loss reduction wallet cards are on the right, which can be ordered for free on our website as well. These are a great conversation starter with your customers and can also serve as handouts in meetings. To date, we have distributed more than 25,000. Our next two webinars will occur in January. The first will discuss negotiating conservation leases, part of an introductory series brought to you by both PARM and American Farmland Trust. The second webinar in January is part of our regular PARM series and will discuss nitrogen rate research to improve profitability and water quality. Please note that we take into consideration your suggestions for webinar topics, so be sure to fill out our evaluation form after the webinar. Don't forget to take our 2018 and annual egg retailer survey. This survey is vital for our egg industry and your location. Look for the survey link in our follow-up email or on our website. Please, please be sure to take only one survey per egg retailer branch or location by January 15th. By participating in the survey, you will receive an individual report detailing your phosphorus and nitrogen loss reductions from specific products and services, along with an aggregate report that incorpor incorporates all survey respondent data. Names and locations are kept anonymous. We also invite you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for PARM updates and industry news.
Today's webinar is sponsored by Purdue University's Center for Food and Agricultural Business. We will now hear from Mike Gunderson, Associate Director for Purdue's University, Purdue University's Center for Food and Agricultural Business. Thanks, Julia, and I'm excited to be with a group this morning. I know that you uh, had an opportunity to hear from my colleague in the last webinar, Betty Jones Bliss, and she talked very specifically about our Ag Retail Association Management Academy that's coming up in January, and I uh, hope you found that useful. Today, I uh, want to provide an overview of all of our 2019 program offerings. So as you are preparing for uh, performance reviews, I'm sure that's not anything anybody's excited about, but also thinking about your professional development and the opportunities to improve your ability to work with key partners and uh, improve efficiency and improve uh, profitability. We've got some things that might help you uh, with that. So last uh, webinar, Betty Jones Bliss did manage, uh, mention that coming up in January, the end of January, we have our Ag Retail Association Management Academy. Um, it's way overstated to say this is a mini MBA, but you do get exposure to several topics that you would find in an MBA program, such as strategic thinking, leadership, uh, financial analysis, sales, marketing, uh, and other topics. So we're really looking forward to it. We have a great partnership with Arizona State University, and uh, that allows us to uh, lure people to Tempe, Arizona, where it's nice and warm and sunny at the end of January, rather than West Lafayette, Indiana. The other management academy a management academy that we do is in partnership with the American Seed Trade Association. Uh, we will be hosting that one here in West Lafayette at Purdue from March 4th till the 8th. Uh, pretty similar uh, to the ARA Management Academy, but a heavy focus on the seed industry and the uh, factors that are influencing success there. But again, uh, exposure to a lot of different uh, management topics, including strategic thinking, leadership, supply chain, finance, and marketing. So um, really excited to partner with two great uh, industry organizations on those programs. And the rest of the programs are, uh, we don't have a particular partner with, but we do uh, have some categories, areas that you might be focusing on for professional development in 2019. So we do have four programs in the sales and marketing area. Sales management and leadership are for those that are leading a sales team. And uh, May 29th and 30th here in West Lafayette, it's a great opportunity to interact with Scott Downey, uh, who has uh, updated the book on agricultural sales and teaches our sales program here and has some tips for uh, helping set goals and managing people to those goals in, in sales roles. We also have uh, precision selling, which is specifically for frontline salespeople. So thinking about how you work with key accounts, how you build that relationship, enhance the trust that you have with those key accounts, and then begin to deliver uh, on a mutually beneficial partnership. That'll happen uh, right there at the end of July, beginning of August. We have two uh, marketing programs. Market planning for agri-marketers is happening uh, July 23rd through the 25th. That's a real deep dive in the four P's of marketing, and that's uh, product, place, price, and promotion. And how does a marketing plan around those four P's get executed in the organization? So um, uh, a program appropriate for folks that are relatively new to marketing and the four P's. Strategic agri-marketing, October 8th through the 10th, uh, more of a higher level focus. So taking those four Ps uh, into uh, another level and thinking about how we segment customers and use that uh, for decision making. So all of those programs feature Scott Downey, who does a great job, but also uh, Dave Downey is a part of some of those programs. And uh, Dave started our center 30 years ago with the intent of working with folks like you in industry to be more successful. The second set of uh, uh, areas, the second topic area is financial and strategic decision making. This is for the folks that like numbers in the group. And so um, even if you don't like numbers, you can come um, to these programs and think about how you communicate with those that do like numbers. 
we have two uh, finance focused programs. The first one is analyzing your profitability from decisions you've made in the past so that you can make better decisions in the future as it relates to a profitable enterprise. So June 17th through 19th, we'll be walking through the DuPont identity of profitability and thinking about how your decisions impact your organization's outcomes. The second half of that week, June 19th through the 21st, we're going to uh, use some investment analysis tools to look forward into the future. Um, how do we think about opportunities to deploy resources, human capital, uh, physical assets, and marketing resources? And um, if you want, you can come the entire week. And I'd love to have you here. I'm the lead faculty member on that program. And uh, five full days of me and Jacqueline Crop and the others that are a part of that program uh, will be beneficial. But you can also choose to come to one or the other, um, particularly for those that have already come to the profitability analysis. This investment analysis portion should be attractive. We also have a strategic decision-making program. Uh, Alan Gray, Nathan Thompson, and Nicole Widmar partner on that program July 9th through the 11th. Really thinking about uh, strategic decisions, how to rethink uh, with real options and heat mapping and managing risk. Um, if you're working on a project and trying to think about uh, how you think about managing the risk associated with that. This is a great program and oftentimes uh, companies bring two or three people that are working together on a project and there is time in that program to work on that project and apply the concepts right away. Uh, another area that we might uh, have something for you in is leadership and talent management. Already talked a little bit about sales management and leadership at the end of May. We also have a program called Managing Talent to Win June 25th through the 27th. Um, Dr. Gray and I partner on that uh, to help folks that are new to leadership roles think about how do you build your team, work with your team, coach your team, uh, manage them towards their performance goals uh, and connect those goals to the organization goals. So um, another program where folks that uh, send two or three individuals from an organization really seems to get more out of it than maybe if you come by yourself, but we definitely have um, folks that are just one from a company come and find value in it too. Uh, we'll finish our year of uh, programs with some research-driven insights. We are a land-grant university and are at the cutting edge of research, and so our Food and Agribusiness Executive Summit will be October 1st through the 3rd. There we're looking for senior leaders and organizations to spend uh, time together networking and discussing current issues in food and agribusiness. We draw broadly across the value chain um, and really have a great discussion around six case studies that our faculty here and at other universities write. And then our national conference for agribusiness will be November 6th and 7th here in West Lafayette. And we'll be uh, conducting some research that will allow us to share some insights with the industry, think about some of the challenges that you're facing and how we might uh, be more successful going forward. That's a uh, uh, intended for a very broad audience, anybody in any organization that's looking to come and get the latest research on agribusiness, food and agribusiness management, uh, that programs for them. If, uh, if maybe one of those doesn't fit very well or you want to um, have a larger group than just a few from your organization, perhaps you have 20 or 30 folks that need uh, similar skills, then we can tailor custom programs to your needs. And the best person to get in touch with uh, regarding that is Asa Good, our business development leader, and her contact information is on the screen. You're uh, certainly willing, uh, you're certainly um, able to contact me and I can answer questions about it, but Asa is really adept at uh, working with you to understand what are the things that the center, our staff, and our faculty can do to help you and your organization uh, achieve your learner learning and um, development goals. So, uh, Julia, I think I'm out of time, so I'll kick it back over to you unless there's any questions. Thank you, Mike, and to all of Purdue University's Center for Food and Agricultural Business for being our sponsor today. Now, we'll get the presentation started with Dr. Scott Shearer, Professor and Chair of the Food, Agricultural, and Biological Engineering Department at The Ohio State University.
thank you very much for the introduction, Julia. Are we good to go? Yes, looks good. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us this morning. Um, before I get started with the presentation, I want to remind everybody I'm an engineer, not an agronomist. And, and so what I want to do is, is try to get people thinking about technologies that can be brought to bear to manage nutrients in a bit of a different uh, uh, methodology, if you want to think of it that way. Um, We've all heard about the four R's, um, and, and, and I think there's a lot of value in, in farmers thinking carefully through um, the, this, this issue about the right source, the right rate, the right time, and the right place. But one of the things I might add into that would be uh, a fifth R, and that is uh, using the right technology as well. And, and when I look at the right source, the right rate, the right time, and the right place, technology really affects all of those in some form or fashion. For the balance of this uh, presentation, I'm going to concentrate on both phosphorus and nitrogen, and I, I want to do so for a primary reason, and that is when I think of many of these um, management practices, what I'm really thinking about is the opportunity to bring technology in and improve water quality, but also there's a cost to technology, and so the question is, are farmers going to realize um, additional profit potential when they, when they adopt the technology? That profit potential obviously is going to come through the form of increased yields, perhaps, or, um, and, and perhaps just as important or more importantly when we look at an environmental sense, um, increasing the uh, use efficiency of the nutrients that are being used. And, and really what I want to think about or what I think about often is can we reduce those fertilizer bills in some respects. In other words, let's, let's apply the material in a fashion that uh, meets the plant needs and uh, ensures that we uh, minimize the off-site movement. Um, technology, and I, I, I throw this slide up only to get people thinking about what's happened in the last, uh, I'm going to say, really 10 years in, in terms of a number of uh, field operations. Precision Ag's been around since about the mid-1990s with the advent of GPS, but, but I think there's been a rapid acceleration um, with really the uh, the reduction in cost of microelectronics, um, wireless communications being much more prevalent, the bandwidth expanding, and then obviously the fact that um, we have GPS that's uh, ubiquitous in, in terms of being able to provide positioning. I show this uh, this this view right here of the modern planter and uh, a number of sensors and control elements on those. On, that, on this planter. Um, this is a 16-row planter, but what I want to try to get people thinking about is many of those sensors and, uh, and control elements are replicated 16 times across the width of that planter. When you begin thinking about what's going on is there's a tremendous amount of data being generated, and uh, we're really getting very good at controlling every aspect um, in, in, in terms of how we manage many of the inputs uh, to production practices. This next one, uh, I, I like this. This is just a couple uh, um, images coming off of the, the planter in this case. The lower right-hand corner is seed singulation, but if you begin looking at the little dots there, we're just about to the, the point where we can map the GPS coordinates of every seed that's put in the ground. The red dots are indicative of skips or where a seed was missed, and the blue dots in that lower right-hand corner are indicative of two seeds being dropped in one location. When you think about the precision and the accuracy of seed placement today, it's pretty tremendous. And what I want to do is get people thinking about, can we begin managing nitrogen and phosphorus um, in the same manner? The, uh, the kind of the, the blue, green, and, and purple image um, in kind of the upper left-hand middle of the page there, if you would, in terms of the insets, that's downforce on the planter. Um, this was a study that we did in terms of some compaction zones. We ran a grain cart diagonally across the field that we planted. And uh, sure enough, um, we, we were able to pick up those compaction zones pretty readily, the green tracks in there. Um, I, I only use this as an example to get people thinking about how prevalent sensors are on most of the equipment today. Uh, my colleagues and I, a couple years back, attempted to uh, estimate the amount of data being generated in North America on a typical farm. And, and what we boiled it down to is about a half a kilobyte per corn plant per growing season. Now, that may not mean much to many people, and, and I can appreciate that. 
um, I had an occasion an extension meeting. Uh, uh, a person came up to me afterwards and wanted a, a little bit more concrete representation of that. And I said, basically today we're generating data at the rate of about uh, 9,000 email messages per acre per year. And, and what I was trying to do is put it in terms that people could begin to appreciate. Um, again, recognizing that a lot of farmers in business, at least in the state of Ohio, is their, their primary profession. Generally, that's going to be a couple thousand acres, and so you begin to get a pretty good handle on the volumes of data coming off of this equipment. And, and by the way, most of the tractors and, and planters and, and, and uh, um, combines, uh, sprayers and things like that come internet connected from the factory today. And so um, kind of an interesting time. Farmers are overwhelmed in some respects by all that data, but there's also a number of opportunities to manage that data. Um, I'm going to kind of switch over. Um, a lot of this presentation relies on uh, um, a, a publication by Mailer, um, R.L. Mailer from uh, Idaho State University back in 2001. I know it's a bit of a dated publication, but on the other side, uh, on the other hand, uh, it's, it's one of those that I found that was fairly complete in addressing um, starter fertilizers as well as NMP management, although, albeit in a bit of a more arid um, region in some respects. Uh, kind of starts off with this issue between broadcast and, and, and banding of nutrients. Um, the, the author suggests there are multiple uh, uh, nutrients that get uh, broadcast in many cases. I'll probably take exception to the nitrogen one in some respects when we begin looking at split applications. But what I thought was a bit interesting was that um, basically what the author says, banded nutrients uh, recommends phosphorus be banded. Um, and, and again, western part of the U.S. in some respects. Um, I also liked uh, one of the graphics that uh, was in the, the, the Mailer publication. This is on the left-hand side. We look at kind of where the nutrients uh, end up um, depending upon what the tillage regimen is. I'm not suggesting we till, but uh, in, in broadcast top-dressed applications of nutrients, um, we, we tend to get that nutrient stratification going on, and, and there's pretty good evidence of this and what's happening in, in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, obviously, depending upon what the tillage regimen is, that changes a bit. And, and so, again, um, I, the, the, the days of, of you know, moldboard plows are behind us. We'll, we'll never go back to those. Um, you know, no-till farming and conservation tillage is here to stay, but we also have to recognize as we continue to do uh, broadcast or top-dressed applications um, that there is that nutrient stratification going on. If you look in the right-hand figure, um, and this comes from Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio, they've been looking at water quality aspects uh, in the state of Ohio for quite some time. But please note that, that um, and, and again, this is parts per million, I think Malik 3, but Please note that uh, zero to one inch layer, um, somewhere close to about 50, uh, 57, 58 parts per million. And then as you go down in the soil profile and you get down to the five to eight inch depth, obviously a, a much lower rate in some respects. And so that really that top inch of topsoil, if you will, uh, we're, we're seeing um, nutrient levels that might be two or three times as high as what it might be in that, uh, that traditional uh, seven inch depth of soil. Um, is this contributing to some of our problems in the Western Lake Erie Basin? Quite honestly, it could be in some respects. Um, but one of the things I continue to think about too is, is making certain that that phosphorus is uh, available to the plants. Um, broadcast fertilizer application, some of the advantages, and, and everybody recognizes this, it's easy to apply. Um, uniform fertilizer distribution, if you're paying attention to the settings on the equipment, the other thing I think that's very intriguing about this, obviously, and, and one of the things that drives this application process is high capacity. In other words, you can cover a lot of acres per day. Um, obviously, there's a lot of, of downsides to it, and I think the one um, when we look at it and we get concerned about is that it leaves the non-mobile nutrients uh, uh, on the soil surface, making them less available to the root zone. And again, that's one of the things that I keep thinking about in, in terms of uh, the value of some of the new technologies. Um, in, in, my, in my professional career, we've done quite a bit with uh, variable rate fertilizer application. I'm not going to go through um, 
some, some of the theories behind variable rate fertilizer application, but I do want to get people thinking about a, a couple concepts here. Um, we did, and, and this was when John Fulton was uh, at the University of Kentucky and I was there. Uh, John was my PhD student, but we did quite a bit with variable rap, rate application in looking specifically at spread patterns on equipment as rates changed on that equipment. We did both spinner spreaders and, and air boom spreaders. A um, lot of pan testing, a tremendous amount of work, but I kind of want to boil it down to a, a couple graphics here. If we look at the left-hand side, this is a, a field that was uh, grid sampled on a one-acre grid. Um, there is an uh, as-applied um, map, and I'll kind of get back to that. That's the dots. And then in the background, what we see is the original prescription map. So oftentimes, I think, when we look at variable rate application of, of fertilizer in particular, a lot of people look at the prescription and say that's the way that the fertilizer got applied. Well, we know that's not the case. And, and depending upon whether it's an air boom truck or a spinner spreader, those dots essentially that you see on a regular line grid, if you see those dots or the dots uh, are visible, it, it, it indicates that the as applied rate in that field actually varied from what the prescription called for. Now, in some regions, um, especially in some of the lighter green blocks, pretty good matchup between what the application equipment was able to do and, uh, and what was called for in terms of uh, the map itself. Um, the reason why I talk about this is I want to continue to remind people that when we look at variable rate application, um, a lot of those application errors are, are really as a result of uh, the human um, element, if you will. Um, what, what I tend to say is that one-third one of that application error might be tied to the equipment, the manufacturer of the equipment. About a third of it's going to be tied to who set that equipment up, and then the other third is going to be tied to who's sitting in the seat um, when, the, when that material is being applied. And what this goes back to is fundamental um, type stuff. When you look at those, uh, that application equipment, it has to be calibrated uh, correctly. But the other thing is, and especially when we look at spinner spreaders, is looking at that spread pattern and realizing the overlap is, uh, is how we go about uh, attempting to, anyways, achieve uniformity in terms of uh, the application rates. And so, again, a lot of dynamics there. Just want to get people thinking that just because you have a prescription map does not necessarily mean that fertilizer got applied in that manner. On the other hand, we can do a very good job of application, especially in a variable rate sense, but uh, the human element's uh, responsible for a, a significant portion of that. Um, also, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that are going on in terms of new technologies and, and trying to figure out how to use some of these. Um, recently released product from uh, Precision Planting. I'm not uh, in, in, in the... In, 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 I'm not through this seminar or a webinar going to be endorsing products. I'm merely uh, presenting these as examples of what's available in the marketplace. And, and just to get people thinking about how we might be using um, these uh, technologies in the future. But uh, Precision Planning came out with the Smart Firmer. The Smart Firmer goes on the planter. It's one of the things that actually uh, pushes the seed um, down into the furrow when it comes out of the delivery tube. Um, in the case of the smart firmer, there is a glass or a quartz glass window on it, and there's sensing capabilities. And one of the things that's kind of unique, you can sense many things, but the map you see in the upper left-hand corner essentially is organic matter content of the soils. And so one of the things I begin thinking about is, is if we have that map, if we know what the variability is in organic matter content, does that change the way we apply some of our nutrients? Um, as, as we kind of look to the future in some respects. Um, we know that we've always paid attention to organic matter content when making fertilizer recommendations, but now we can truly track that uh, variability throughout the field and, and do it on a very uh, fine resolution in some respects. And so again, it's not the sort of thing where every uh, row unit on the planter necessarily has to have one of these sensors, but if you think about beginning to map the organic matter content in the field, it could be a, get a, a bit of a game changer uh, for some of the producers. Again, I'm not recommending this product to the exclusion of others that are suitable. Um, uh, again, the intent is just to kind of get people thinking about uh, some of the opportunities. By the way, throughout this presentation, I've also tried to uh, provide either web links or uh, uh, the, the original source documents for much of this information. Um, 
when, when we begin looking at what's going on in terms of cloud-based uh, um, cloud based applications, there's a lot of these out there. Um, again, I'm just going to kind of put three of them out there for people to think about. Uh, subscription rates on these um, obviously vary a bit from product to product. Um, it's, it's kind of unique because a number of these have uh, essentially nitrogen management models behind them. And most of these organizations are trying to couple weather data, historical in nature in some respects, looking at precipitation, some interesting ways of projecting the variability in rainfall events as they occur across the landscape, um, using some radar data. The, the other thing is most of these uh, online um, sites also have access to uh, remote sensed imagery of one type or, not, uh, or another. Obviously, there's a per acre cost to most of these, or at least a cost for, uh, for signing up or, uh, um, in, in terms of having access to these tools. But uh, for some producers, this, this may fill a niche or feel, uh, fill a void um, that, that uh, might have existed. The other thing I'm going to say is we also see uh, a number of certified crop advisors use, use, using some of these tools as well. I point to a climate field view, and, and obviously many of you know the history of, of that organization. Another one is in Circa, uh, kind of a pioneer product, if you will, and, and it's been around for a while. And then the other one is, is ADAPT-N, which essentially grew out of uh, Cornell University, um, was commercialized, and again, a nitrogen management tool there. Uh, a lot of other things, obviously, included in that package, but recently it was uh, purchased by Yara. So. Uh, again, some great online tools to help new, uh, farmers begin managing nutrients um, if, if that is a direction that they feel uh, um, like they need to go. Um, th the other thing that I'd like to point to, and this is a, um, kind of a, a survey done by John Fulton here at Ohio State. He went out and, and looked at uh, what's available to help producers manage nutrients in terms of apps that can be uh, downloaded to smartphones. Um, I kind of have a summary here. John broke this out into several categories, but uh, nutrient information uh, and calculators, um, whole category of equipment setup, record keeping, uh, soil sampling. Many of these are free. Many of them have a, a nominal cost associated with them. There's field data management and weather, but when John got done, he identified 87 different apps that farmers have access to today. Uh, to help guide them in terms of, of managing nutrients, whether those be um, commercial fertilizers or even animal nutrient sources on the farm. And so tremendous tools out there at the fingertips of farmers in the field today. Um, things are headed in a great direction, whether you look at some of the online applications or look at, 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 at some of the apps that could be downloaded to the smartphone. Increasingly, farmers have access to a lot of information at their fingertips uh, in, in field settings. Uh, again, there's the uh, web link for the online publication that uh, Dr. Fulton's put together. Um, one of the things that we had the pleasure of doing is working with several companies. Uh, and this started back in about 2014, went through about 2016 and 2017. But one of the things we began looking at was uh, late season end management. Um, I think the big, uh, the big thing that caught a lot of people's attention, obviously there were some attachments that could be uh, um, used to uh, distribute the nitrogen in the field. Any of you might be thinking of Y drops at this point in time, but I think one of the main reasons we got to the point where we began talking about late season end application, especially in corn crops, is the fact that a, a new class of uh, high clearance sprayers came out. Um, one of the things that we found is if we could get a sprayer with 72 inches of ground clearance underneath the machine, um, we can go through just about any cornfield um, that, that at, at any stage of development. Uh, a lot of those uh, fields that we applied in were well after tassel in some respects. Um, one of the things we did find is when you have a 60-inch clearance machine, you're somewhat limited. Um, you can get into the field up through at, up to just about tassel, but uh, to go much beyond that, obviously, you begin bending the corn plants over and they uh, uh, don't necessarily straighten up. And so again. The break point we found was kind of that magic of, of 72 inches of clearance we could get through just about any field, uh, at least of corn in the state of Ohio. This uh, this is a pretty nice graphic that indicates the uh, rate of uptake of nitrogen by the corn plant. And, and you'll notice 
the vegetative state, obviously, uh, things go along pretty well, but uh, really when you start getting the biomass in the plant that goes into the reproductive state is where we see um, a lot of the nitrogen being consumed by the plant itself. And so our mindset about late season N application in some respects is we, we recognize um, the weather is going to control a lot of what goes on with uh, nitrogen applied in the field if it's applied early in the season. Rainfall events obviously can can uh, remove some of that nutrients, uh, some of the nitrogen from the soil, if you will. Um, obviously, you have denitrification going on in some cases. We also recognize that the soil mineralizes a lot of nitrogen under proper conditions. But I, I guess the what really, to me, late season N application means is we can delay making some decisions, if you will, in terms of how much of our nitrogen uh, we use and at what time of the season. I think farmers recognize that the split applications of nitrogen, that there's value there. Um, extending that a little bit further into the growing season, there could be value though um, for those people that have cl high clearance machines in terms of delaying um, the, the, the final nitrogen application decision. A lot of what we were doing was holding about 30 or 40 units of N to the end of the season. We might make the argument in some cases when the, when the soil mineralizes enough nitrogen, you don't need to apply it. In other cases, um, when we have uh, high rainfall events, uh, we get to that part of the season where maybe the corn needed a little bit more nitrogen in some respects. Again, not applying it up front in the season gives us a little bit of latitude as to how we may, uh, manage later in the season. Obviously, uh, part of that's going to be predicated on the ability to get through the field with high clearance machines. Um, the, the, the other thing I'm going to say about this in some respects is, and there's been a lot of reflectance-based sensing um, work, there's a lot of tools out there that farmers have at their hands. Uh, a lot of these NDVI meters in terms of looking at chlorophyll content in plants really got started in, in small grains with, uh, with, with management of wheat. Uh, we know that there's been a, a moderate success using these in corn in some respects, but again, the, the, there's really kind of a comparison going on in terms of uh, uh, luxury nitrogen or nitrogen-rich strips and comparing that to the rest of the field. I'm going to come back and talk about a couple things we're doing here at Ohio State that uh, might get people thinking a little bit differently, uh, too, in terms of how some of these tools can be used. But um, tremendous number of uh, options in the marketplace today. A um, little bit of competition there. Some of these are pretty cost-effective. Uh, they range from handheld devices to Devices that can be mounted on the machine and, and control uh, um, nitrogen application rates in real time. Um, remote sensing, we, we know that there's a lot of interest in Red Edge and NDVI. Um, I point out, and, and I'm not sure you can see my pointer here, but this was a nitrogen investigation we were doing. And in that right hand side, this is an ADVI image coming from Air Scout, but, but kind of a Red Edge. There was a, a zero end treatment region about in the middle of that uh, upper part of the field there. And if we look in the RGB um, uh, image on the left hand side, it's kind of hard to pull, pull that out. But again, when we looked on that, uh, that red edge image on the right hand side, or the uh, ADVI as, as uh, Air Scout calls it, um, that nitrogen deficient zone shows up very readily. Now, I might make the argument that when you're looking from above the crop, by the time you see that uh, um, nitrogen deficiency in the top of the canopy, especially uh, along about V8, V9, V12, somewhere in there, uh, we probably uh, lost some of our yield potential. And so the question becomes is, can we catch that a little bit earlier in the growing season before that occurs? I was talking about late season end application a little bit, uh, tremendous number of attachments for machines out there. Obviously, when you're going into the field late, um, it's going to be tough to get it down below the canopy. And in most of these cases, whether it's a wide drop or, or some kind of uh, straight calder, the intent is to get it down below and get it to the surface uh, of the soil. In the case of the wide drop, it's being uh, applied at the base of the plant. And in the case of the uh, um, straight calders, what we're attempting to do is get that uh, UAN solution below the soil surface. Um, Benefits to both of those, uh, I'm not going to argue one's better than necessarily than another, but uh, a lot of interest on the part of farmers from using this type of technology. Um, we worked with uh, several farmers in a project with uh, a couple sponsors. Um, and and in, in all of these cases, you're going to kind of look at the nitrogen management uh, approach 
on the right hand side um, split applications of nitrogen. Please note that um, the, the, the rates in, in terms of all these, the total amount of N going on the field was the same. But one of the things I want to point to in some respects is kind of the aqua colored, the BC, uh, planter side dress and light, late season. In almost every case, it was close to being the most profitable in some respects. Now, one of the things I want to caution people about is this is one year of data. Um, I'm not ready to tell everybody go out and, and buy a high clearance sprayer and do late season N application. But when I look at most of these, um, when, when we look at that profitability, um, at the end of the day, um, splitting that, uh, those applications up and, and uh, applying the nitrogen throughout the growing season, there is value to it. Um, the question becomes is, can we do that consistently year after year? And, and so again, we think there's something there. Um, uh, what, it, what it boils down to in some respects, in some of these cases, we may not have needed to make that late season end, um, that, that third application. And obviously there's a savings in nitrogen there and the cost of running the equipment. So uh, again, just some food for thought to get people thinking. Um, this is uh, one year's worth of data. So I wanna be careful that, uh, uh, again, we don't encourage everybody to go out and you know, adopt the technology, but uh, we're moving in that direction. There's something positive there. I mentioned before that uh, we began looking at things a little bit differently at Ohio State. Um, instead of flying drones over the top of the crop, one of the things we began doing is, um, is actually dropping a camera head down into the crop. Um, some value in soybeans, and that's what's happening on the right-hand side. You see a multi-rotor drone, left-hand side. Um, we're doing some real-time data communications. Um, most of these things are off the shelf. The cameras are, we're using um, are actually the Raspberry Pi cameras. They're nothing special. The camera's are about 27 bucks a piece. Um, very cost effective. You'll notice um, in, in the uh, 3D image in the middle, the camera's kind of oriented up at a, a 45 degree angle. And we also, there, there's two, one on either side of this. And then we also have two cameras angled down at a 45 degree angle. What I want to get to though is, is what we're doing with the imagery. Um, what I'm showing here are some, uh, some, some typical uh, corn uh, crop stressors. There's nitrogen deficiency and we're looking at the lower leaves of the plant here and we begin to see the yellow uh, mid ribs of the leaves exhibiting that. There's a phosphorus deficiency uh, in the lower left hand corner and you notice the margins of those lower leaves begin showing some of that stress. Uh, we, we look at the corn borer, uh, obviously insect damage in this case. Uh, in that central image, and then uh, northern corn leaf blight and gray leaf spot, we begin looking at the lesions on the leaves. But my, my point in, in being is by the time we see some of these manifesting themselves in the top of the corn crop canopy, it may be too late to recover um, some of the loss that we've incurred. And so our approach has been to begin using artificial intelligence to look at these images and, and identify the crop stress. Um, we have this lab set up, we take it to the field, we do a lot of our image processing in the field. Um, again, this is a research development tool, but we're also looking at what it's gonna to take to commercialize this. Um, a lot of this stuff goes away in terms of the, the, the research capability. I think we get to the point where the drone is actually doing the artificial intelligence, if you will, processing capacity on the drone and actually returning what the crop stress is to the, the certified crop advisor in the field. What we're really thinking about doing is being able to put that drone, put that camera head in on virtually any location in the field, as opposed to putting the human in that location. I show these confusion matrices. Um, this is the, the uh, accuracy of our classification. We start out by uh, discriminating between biotic and abiotic stresses. We're able to do that with about 98% accuracy. And then we begin looking at, uh, in, in the case of the uh, abiotic stress, if it's a nutrient-induced stress, you'll notice that we're able to uh, discriminate with about somewhere around 87, 88% accuracy between the various nutrient stresses. Now, we only have three in this case, but, but again, I th think this begins to show the power of artificial intelligence and how it's gonna be uh, deployed in the field. Um, again, a bit of a different look at how we use unmanned aerial systems to look within the crop canopy. That stinger, um, that, that uh, uh, it's about three meter long a fiberglass pole that has the camera on the end of it. We're able to drop that down into the canopy and take pictures on the way in. 
as well as when we withdraw from the canopy and take pictures on the way out. So uh, this is preliminary data. We're, we're pretty far down the road on corn. And, and so then uh, this, this year, this cropping season, we were working with soybeans. But again, if we can begin detecting some of these nutrient deficiencies at a stage in the growth of the crop where we can get in and, and uh, mitigate those problems, um, could have some pretty profound implications for the future. Fertilizer placement in general, um, I like these two uh, comments, and again, this is going back to the, the, the Mailer publication, proves uh, plant uptake efficiency and encourages maximum yield of intensively managed crops. I think at the end of the day, farmers and uh, environmentalists alike are looking at that nitrogen use efficiency or phosphorus use efficiency, and anything that we can do to improve that uh, really serves the interest of, of everybody concerned. Um, that bottom one is protects both surface and groundwater quality. Whole host of tools uh, that have come out recently to, to help with some of this. I'm going to try to put it in perspective. Um, but research data suggests that a definite yield advantage with pop-up and banded pea applications in wet soil conditions. So again, for no-till farmers or conservation tillage farmers where the soils take a little bit longer to, to warm up because of the residue on top, this could have some, some, some pretty significant implications. Um, and this is something we've known for quite some time as well. Um, strip till, a lot of interest. I know that a lot of strip till rigs were purchased when some of the farmers didn't necessarily see a significant yield advantage. Uh, they began looking at the cost. They began looking at, um, um, if you will, the time commitment, whether or not uh, strip till was being done in the fall with deep banding or uh, whether or not there was any, any possibility of doing it in the spring. But one of the things we do know is that uh, the, those soils, those strips anyways, they warm up a little bit more quickly in the spring, again, because they don't necessarily have as uh, the residue, uh, at least over the row. Now, all of this assumes that with the strip till operation that you can go back and plant into those strips as well. And, and so we have to think very carefully about what technologies allow us to do that. Um, increasingly, I think it's about the uh, the precision and accuracy, if you will, of placing fertilizer or nutrients within the soil, uh, but it's also going to be how precisely and accurately we can we can uh, we can seed next to those in the case of strip till, and or after the fact, obviously running side dress um, equipment uh, next to those rows that we've already planted. Um, a lot of strip till equipment out there today, um, various product carts. Uh, it's kind of a mix and match type scenario in some respects. Farmers don't necessarily have to buy everything from one manufacturer. In the case of Horthman, they do provide everything. In the case of Montag, though, they're, they're uh, providing a, um, a product cart for delivery of uh, granular fertilizers, and obviously the farmer can, uh, can mate that to whatever strip-till implement uh, they, they so choose. Um, one of the unfortunate are downsides to the uh, um, the amount of equipment that's out there today is obviously farmers selecting that complement that makes sense and, and uh, is germane to their application. Um, this is some work we did a, a while back, and I want to get people thinking about this thing of, of being able to have the planter follow um, in the strips that have been tilled. Uh, we began looking at how implements follow tractors. I don't think there's any argument today that with with automated guidance, we can guide a tractor with, to within about two, two and a half centimeters horizontal accuracy, but that doesn't necessarily mean the planter follows behind the tractor quite as accurately. And so one of the things we were doing for the company we were working with is we were looking at how implements follow tractors. In this case, um, this is a three-point hitch mounted planter, and everybody was thinking it would follow uh, the tractor the best because it was a more rigid attachment to the tractor. Well, we didn't necessarily see that uh, in the end result. One of the things that we found and in, in is kind of inherent in the data I'm going to show next is on the left-hand side, it was really, this is the, the tracking of the antenna. We're looking at cross-track error here of the tractor. And then we also had a GPS antenna on the implement. We began looking at implement following. Now, when you look at the uh, left-hand side, you'll notice um, that, uh, that there's implement sensitivity, there's different implements. That, that higher row is the implement sensitivity, one, two, and three there. We got low, intermediate, and high sensitivity. And then the bottom one, the big one, the two here and the three, uh, number one was an integral planter. Okay, so in other words, it was on the three-point hitch. Uh, number two is a tillage tool, and then number three is a toad planter. 
uh, when, when we look at those, um, you notice the tractor is able to guide itself pretty accurately. And again, it's, it's generally in that uh, two to three centimeter uh, cross track error range. These are whisker plots, so it kind of shows the variability too. However, when we look at the antenna on the implement, please notice that the implement doesn't track quite as true. Um, when I begin looking at uh, the, the tillage tool, um, it, it tracks a little bit better in some cases, but not all. Um, on the other hand, the planters, they kind of wander back and forth uh, in, in some cases. When we look over here uh, and kind of look at a couple of the planters, depending upon what the sensitivity is, you know, we can have a, a 10 or 12 centimeter cross track error. Basically, what we're, what we're finding is, is the, uh, the implement following in a lot of cases that the cross track error is going to be four to five times what it is for the tractor. Now, whether or not farmers can live with that, well, that's, that's the decision they're going to have to make in some respects. But again, as we go to these more intensive uh, nutrient management systems, the question becomes, how do we get the implement to follow, um, if you will, the tractor itself? No question we can guide the tractor, but again, how do we get the implement to follow? Tremendous number of attachments out there today. This is uh, the Orthman Tracker 4. It's an attachment that goes on the planter and, and, and essentially steers or guides the planter. Um, there's some creative solutions coming out today, a, a number of them. Um, Hudson Farm has the ProTracker. Um, you can, it's either semi-integral, goes on the three-point hitch, if you will, that lower right-hand corner, or a drawbar model for, for pulling tillage tools or, to, or drawn planters. Um, and then the other one is the Sunco uh, hitch, which, which, again, all these are a little bit different. One of the nice things is they'll tend to integrate into uh, systems, whether you're using a deer system or maybe you're using uh, Trimble navigation components. A lot of these will, will meet up with those systems. Just trying to get people to think about what it's going to take as we move towards this uh, precision placement of nutrients. Uh, LaForge is another company. Uh, LaForge is known for making three-point hitches for the front of tractors, but they're making this uh, three-point hitch device um, that obviously does side shifts. So again, a lot of these out there, I'm not selling any of them. I'm not recommending any of them. I'm just saying to uh, to people, when you think about implement guidance, uh, there's some technology out there that's going to help quite a bit. Um, well, there's also proliferation of tools for help managing, helping to manage um, pop-up as well as banded fertilizer placement uh, at, at planting time. Um, I've made the statement many times before that in many locations in the state of Ohio, we can probably handle all of our phosphorus needs in corn through starter fertilizer. Now, I'm kind of cautious there, obviously, because uh, there is that, that uh, salt accumulation problem and the viability of the seed. Um, one, of the, one of the easiest things for farmers to do is use pop-up starter fertilizer because it's really just placing a, tur a tube down in the, the furrow and getting to the point where you can meter um, starter fertilizer into the furrow with the seed. One of the things you do have to be careful about, obviously, is the rate at which you're going to do that. Um, pop-up starter, one of, the, one of the advantages is it decreases loss of nutrients by erosion compared with surface placement. I don't think anybody will argue with that. Um, but, but again, the disadvantage is, is seeds are subject to salt injury if the, the fertilizer is too concentrated. And, and so that's always been one of those problems. Uh, pretty good recommendations. Uh, when you look at this mailer publication, um, the number of universities have these recommendations. And, and again, I just want to get farmers thinking about um, um, and paying attention to some of these things in terms of the, the, the salt accumulations. Um, the Schaffer rebounder is kind of an interesting one. Um, this is one where uh, they're pushing the seed down into the trench, but yet they also are delivering nitrogen right behind it or starter fertilizer, whichever the case may be. It could be a phosphorus uh, nitrogen um, solution, UAN solution. But, but again, a lot of people are coming up with a lot of different ways to deliver pop-up starter. Um, fertilizer banding, this comes to a point where it's, it's a lot of different uh, options now. Uh, improves nutrient use efficiency, retains nutrients during soil erosion, and uh, at the end of the day, in some cases, obviously, is going to require a little bit more costly um, equipment or equipment modification. Um, one of the things that we've always talked about in terms of banded fertilizer application is the two-by-two two placement. Today, we begin talking about the two-by-two-by-two two two, uh, placement. In other words, 
we're going to place starter fertilizer on either side of the furrow. Uh, we, we combine that with maybe some pop-up in furrow. I know that if you're watching one of the um, uh, magazine agronomist, I'll say uh, one of the agronomists for one of the, the more prevalent farm publications, he's talked a lot about relay uh, starter fertilizer. I think there's value there, no question about it. Um, again, what it boils down to in some respects is uh, how much starter you can get uh, either that two by two by two placement or with the pop-up uh, in furrow in some respects before you reach that uh, salt um, accumulation uh, problem. Uh, end fertilizer can be lost from soils by multiple mechanisms. I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know here, volatilization, leaching, surface runoff, and erosion. Deep banding end fertilizer below plant residue often reduces uh, losses attributed to these factors. However, losses due to leaching may also increase. Starting to see some interest here in, in uh, deep banding of nitrogen. And again, there's, there's only going to be a certain time of the year that you can do that. And then end losses can be minimized by placing uh, fertilizer away from the decaying organic matter, pop up banded applications, place them below the residue later. And I think a lot of people recognize uh, the value there. Again, number of uh, products out there on the market. This one is FurrowJet from Precision Planting. Uh, it's kind of interesting because that, that furrow uh, jet device is actually placing three st uh, streams of fertilizer within the furrow, two off, one off to either side, if you will, and then one obviously in the furrow. So again, a bit of a different way of looking at things in terms of capabilities. Um, Shaffert uh, has, a, has a number of devices today. Um, and again, that, that uh, two by two by two placement in some respects. One of the things that's occurring and people, farmers need to think carefully about is, as we move towards high speed planting operations, the question is, are these devices gonna perform as well as uh, they might at lower speeds? And so my caution to farmers is, five miles an hour, a lot of these device, devices perform very well. The question becomes is, will they, far, that will they perform Similarly, when you get going seven or eight miles an hour, and again, with speed tube um, and, and, and deer solution to high speed planting, that may change things a little bit. So a, a bit of a word of caution there. Um, it was on Pioneer's webpage. They came up with some very good recommendations for broadcast versus banded nutrients in terms of phosphorus fertilizers. I think there's a lot of value here. Um, one of the things is the salt index indice. Um, what they're really trying to do is, is compare what happens when you use different forms of uh, um, fertilizers when you're trying to, to match up with the phosphorus and the nitrogen needs. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, the planters we build here at Ohio State is we're actually being able to place two starter fertilizers at planting time. Uh, when you begin thinking about that and, and you're looking at the variability of the soils, we're using prescriptions there could be some value in being able to have that capacity on the planter. Again, more complexity, um, more cost associated with that, but uh, again, we look at the variability of soils, uh, there, there could be some value in that. Um, this is uh, um, another um, older uh, piece of work, but uh, the individual at, at uh, this location, again, this came off the Pioneer site, but they were uh, citing another reference. Um, they came up with uh, this salt index for a number of different uh, um, fertilizer uh, forms of, of nitrogen, uh, sulfur, phosphorus, and potassium. And so again, as, as you look to your situation or you look to unique situations, depending upon uh, uh, what access you have uh, to some of these nutrient sources, um, here's at least something uh, that, that you can go about comparing what's going on in, in terms of um, that, that salt indice. Um, this is for um, 1034 if you will, um, sandy versus non-sandy soils. Uh, but again, please note that uh, we, we see some rates where we can get up to 40 gallons of, of, uh, of 1034 per acre, um, perhaps placed at planting time in some respects. And so again, thinking a little bit differently about how we might meet uh, the crop the crop needs at different times of the year. The other thing that I'll point to is, um, I know Yield 360, uh, there was some news about a device they had. This is one from Capstan, but uh, being able to uh, place pop-up, if you will, in relationship to the seed as it's put into the furrow. And so the question is, I think the, the Yield 360 device was Dash. Uh, this is the Capstan seed squirter. 
but being able to time how that nitrogen goes into the furrow, so you're either putting it very close to the seed or you're putting it between the seed to avoid that, uh, that salt accumulation. So again, tremendous technology coming. And with that, um, I think we'll see if there is time for uh, a few questions or if I might be able to uh, elaborate on any of the points that I covered in the, uh, in the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Shear, for sharing all of this valuable information with us today. We do have some time for Q&A, so attendees, please enter your questions into the question box on your screen for Dr. Shear. And the first question we have is, in years past, we have been able to offer services to retailers that are included in the price that they pay for their fertilizer and chemical purchases. As technology keeps advancing, it is getting impossible to absorb or build these costs in. Growers are skeptical about their value when we charge for these new services. How can retailers show this value more easily? Uh, excellent question. Um, and I don't know that I'm going to have the best answer necessarily. I understand when margins get tight um, that, that everybody begins looking for um, how they're going to be able to reduce their cost. I'm, I'm certain it's occurring on the retailer side just as, as much as it is on the farmer side in some respects. Um, what I continue to, uh, to, to think about and, and spend quite a bit of time thinking about, many of the things that I talked about are not necessarily uh, valuable to all farmers. Um, in other words, everything's kind of local. It depends upon a farmer's equipment complement. It depends upon what they're going to do for themselves versus uh, what they're going to have somebody else do. Um, it depends upon the size of operations in some respects. Um, I know that farmers come to me from time to time and they'll look at me and they'll say, how do I keep up with all the technology? How do I stay current with everything that I need to be doing uh, to ensure that I'm being profitable, to ensure that I'm managing my resources most effectively? And what I continue to tell farmers is, um, at the end of the day, you can't keep, you can't stay current with everything. And what I tell them is there's probably 10 or 12 things um, that you have to be really good at. Uh, obviously, one of those is marketing grain, and, and I think there's times when farmers might rather be out uh, um, in, in a tractor or a combine in the field than they would be paying attention to grain prices. But my point in all this is I usually tell farmers to pick four or five things that they're really good at and then go purchase the other things uh, from those people that are best qualified to, to provide those. On the retailer side, you're going to have to you're going to have to make the case. Um, and, and I think in some cases, that that's going to involve some level of commitment from the retailers um, to, to be working with farmers in terms of conducting on-farm research to demonstrate the profitability. I know that that's a hard, uh, a hard long uh, slog in some respects, and that obviously that can go either way in terms of the profitability, but uh, at, at, at the end of the day, um, farmers are business people, and if they see value, I can assure you that they're going to subscribe or, or pay for those services. Um, the fact that it was inclu included for free before as, as part of uh, marketing nutrients, that, that was great for farmers, but I think farmers also realize that retailers work on pretty tight margins as well, and not everything's free in life. Um, wish I had a better answer to the question. Okay, next question is, how do you see NIR on the go for manure analysis fitting in the U.S. market? Um, I, I think there's there's two or three things. Um, we we kind of learned, and, and again, this is going back to some work we did before. When we looked at the solids portion uh, of animal manures, and, and again, if they were coming out of barns that were managed consistently, we, we really saw the phosphorus content um, in, in the solids portion of it. And then we saw uh, the, the nitrogen essentially in the liquid portions of it. And so one of the things that, that, that we were looking at in some respects is if we knew the solids content of the manure that was being injected into the ground, we had some hope of predicting uh, what the phosphorus and nitrogen components of it were. Um, one of the things I like about any type of sensing technology, in, in the case of a manure application, especially if it's liquid, um, what, one of the things that we want to know is what the nutrient content of the, the material is. And then the question is, is how do we mass, match that up with the soil landscape? And so I, I think there's a couple opportunities um, there. Um, 
Obviously, what it boils down to in some respects is, is how you're going to amortize the cost of some of this equipment. Uh, for the custom applicators, I think there's there's a, probably a value proposition there to be made. Um, on, on some of the independent farmers that uh, may not do um, quite as much in the way of manure application, it may be a little bit harder to uh, to justify that in some respects. But again, what I go back to is matching up whatever the nutrient source is, knowing what the nutrient content is, and then being able to tie that to the uh, specific field locations. Okay, next question is, strip-till fertilizer applications are offered by very few ag retailers because of expensive equipment and the slow process. Do you know of any other subsurface application methods that could cover acres more quickly? Um, that's a great question, and, and uh, I, I realized that there were a lot of people that kind of jumped out and got into the custom uh, strip-till business. Um, and, and then again, one of the things farmers didn't necessarily see the yield advantage, and so they, they, a lot of people backed off on that. Um, when I begin looking at, at, at subsurface placement, we can do some things with some, some, some individual shanks and things like that. I, I know it's a tough sell um, in, in some respects because the only way you can really cover acres is get wider in, in terms of some of the equipment. Then you got transport problems. Um, I noticed uh, and been looking at, at some people that are looking at two or three years worth of uh, um, nutrient application at a time as opposed to uh, um, looking at uh, a shorter period of time. Um, I, I'm also rec uh, uh, recognized that at least a, a year like this in the state of Ohio, it was dry for quite a bit of harvest and then all of a sudden uh, things got wet and it's just really never uh, um, uh, gotten to the point where we get back into the into the field and do a lot of tillage operations. And so I think that strip till um, is still going to be a, a tough sell in some respects just because of the, the timeliness and, and, you know, p people point out the it's it's quite a bit slower than obviously uh, um, using over-the-top application equipment. I wish I had a better answer to this question as well, but um, I, I just don't see, um, because it's it's horsepower intensive, really speeding up all that much um, in, in terms of the process, not unlike uh, going to, going to high-speed planting. And really the only other way to cover acres is to get wider. Okay, and the last question is, are many egg retailers using the suspended camera technology? How much are they charging growers for this service? And is the current technology dependable? Well, the thing I want to point out, it's in a, it's in a really a research mode right now, and the reason why I showed it is to get think, people thinking about what artificial intelligence is going to mean. Um, in, in terms of the cost of what we're doing, the cost is, is, I'm going to say nominal in some respects now. When I say nominal, really the cost is going to be in the, the cost of the personnel to go out and fly the drone and to put it in those locations in some respects. Um, I, I don't want to be cynical here in some respects, but we know that when you try to put a human in all those locations in the in the field, one of two things are going to happen. Either they're not going to get to all those locations that they need to be in in the field, especially large fields and especially in the middle of the summertime. And then the other side of the coin is um, if they do get to all those uh, field locations, they're not going to cover as many acres um, on a on a in an eight hour or ten hour day. And so, Again, what I kind of come back to is it's technology that's that's coming along. Um, it, it'd be hard for me to put a price on it right now because it's not so much the hardware. It's really going to be access to some of those image libraries that allows you to do the image matching so that you know what, what kind of uh, stresses you're looking at. Um, there, there's some other online services um, with, with some of the, the, the big chemical companies, and, and we're watching those evolve and develop too. Um, again, we're just looking at different ways to think about um, how we're going to go sense what the true uh, crop health problems are in the field. Um, if I had to project anything, I think we're going to see some of these artificial intelligence, especially looking at images. We're going to see some of these online capabilities, um, if they're not here already, certainly occurring within the next two to five years. Um, the cost will be, will, will, will be reasonable. But again, it's, it's not necessarily the hardware. It's going to be the cost of, of what those image libraries are and being able to do the artificial intelligence. 
Okay. In the interest of time, I'd like to wrap up the Q&A. I want to thank you again, Dr. Shear, for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your work. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the opportunity. Okay, and at this time, I want to recognize our premier egg retailer members, the Andersons, a gold member, and silver members, Gerti Egg and Nutrient Egg Solutions. Their contribution helped make this webinar possible and helps promote the strides that egg retailers like you are making to reduce nutrient impairments. I would also like to acknowledge our participating egg retailers that represent more than 4 million acres in both the Great Lakes and Mississippi River basins. If you are an egg retailer in either the Great Lakes Basin or Mississippi River Basin that is interested in becoming a member or participating with PARM to receive tools and resources to increase sales and information on our latest cost shares, please contact our project manager at Caitlin at partnershipfarm.org or visit our website and click become a member to fill out our online form. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge additional funders and collaborators that made this webinar possible. In particular, the Great Lakes Protection Fund, the McKnight Foundation, Clean Lakes Alliance, and Purdue University's Center for Food and Agricultural Business. Datu Research has recently published egg retailer and producer cover crop case studies. These case studies include important information on integrating cover crops into a business model, experiences when first offering and managing cover crops, challenges, and soil health benefits. You can find these on the PARM website under the Egg Retailer tab. Please remember to take our survey. If you have not already received an email in the past week, look for the link in our follow-up email. Again, this survey is vital for our egg industry and your location. Let us help you boost your brand and communicate to important stakeholders and industry members what egg retailers are doing to improve water quality. Please note names and locations are kept anonymous. As we wrap up, please remember to look for the follow-up email in a few days with a webinar evaluation and webinar recording. If you submitted your CCA number at registration and are viewing this webinar live, no further action is required to receive your CEUs. If watching this webinar is a recording, be sure to input your CCA number on the registration form via the links emailed out. If you watch the recording within two weeks of the original air date, no further action is required to receive your CEUs. If watching this webinar more than two weeks after the original broadcast date, email julia at partnershipfarm.org your CCA number to ensure your CEUs are submitted. I want to thank you all again for joining us today, and I hope you join us again for our next two webinars in January.